Great. Thank, thank you, Eric. Thank you, great for, uh, panel, for that great conversation. Now, as we, we get moving to the next phase here, we're going to have a fireside chat. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a wonderful speaker to join me up here. So please use your imagination. There's, there's a little fire here in the middle, nice and toasty warm, and uh, we're going to sit down. Yeah, I'll sit down with you there, uh, and we'll talk on it. So uh, while we get set up, please. Testing, testing. Wonderful. Well, hey, it is, uh, I, I think it's like 90 degrees outside, so maybe air conditioning side chat would have been a, a, good, uh, a good start here. Excuse me, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you. Uh, so really a privilege to be here today with you, sir. Um, so I should start. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our fireside chat <laughs> with Lieutenant General uh, John Shaw, Deputy Commander, U.S. Space Command. I'm Bradley Cheatham, CEO at Advanced Space and Chair of the Future Space Leaders Foundation. Uh, we're really grateful to have the Lieutenant General joining us today to discuss a variety of timely topics uh, related to national security space and more broadly how technology and innovation are going to impact the space industry writ large. Uh, Lieutenant General John E. Shaw is currently the Deputy Commander at U.S. Space Command. Uh, he's a Massachusetts native. Uh, he entered the Air Force in 1990 as a distinguished graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy out in Colorado Springs. Uh, just down the road from us up in Denver, uh, with a degree in astronautical engineering and a minor in Russian language. Uh, Lieutenant General Shaw has served in a variety of air and space uh, operations and staff positions from Silicon Valley to the U.S. Air Force in Europe and has commanded at the squadron, group, wing, and numbered Air Force levels. So for those of you not in tune to military uh, sizing, that's starting with you know, dozens of, of warfighters and uh, increasing up to thousands uh, of warfighters. It's really quite an uh, impressive track record. He's transferred uh, from the Air Force into the Space Force in 2020 uh, upon his promotion to Lieutenant General. Uh, in addition to his day job, uh, helping keep the world safe in space, he's a frequently published author, beginning with his thesis uh, as a second lieutenant, uh, titled Optimal Control Design for an Inverted Cart Pendulum Array. We may have some time for a discussion on inverted pendulum and control theory later, but we'll see if we have uh, time. Um, but that was from the University of Washington. Uh, to his latest publication, which was titled Sailing the New Wine Dark Sea, Space as a Military Area of Responsibility, probably some of those topics are what we're going to talk a little bit more about today. Uh, and even more recently than that, an interview with Lieutenant General Shaw regarding the current state uh, and possibilities for space was published in Wired Magazine, so maybe a little bit of a more general audience conversation. I think all of that work really points to the importance uh, that, that the general clearly places on uh, communicating what, what's going on in space and what's going on uh, at U.S. Space Command. So with that, uh, I'd like to, if I can, start the conversation, sir, um, just by, you know, setting up, if you, if you could set up for us, kind of a starting point to build the rest of our conversation around, uh, including maybe a refresher, since maybe everyone in the room is not plugged in exactly on the differences between Space Force and Space Command, and then we can kind of go from there and talk about what's going on in space. Okay, thank Thanks, Brad. It's great to be here today, and um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, hey, but I, I feel like we need to talk about Brad just a little bit more here, because I don't know if he's had a chance to tell you what he's been working on recently in advanced space. And if any of you have not been tracking uh, the capstone uh, platform that's been, uh, uh, that headed off into space, uh, into Cislunar Space here recently, it's pretty exciting. Has Brad told you all about that earlier today? See, he's just too humble. Um, and so I think you just did your second maneuver here. Uh, we did, yeah, just yesterday. So. Yeah. yeah. Can you just, can you, can so I, the fireside chat, right? Uh, <laughs> can you, about, about 45 seconds on Capstone and what Advanced Space has been doing with that and what the mission is? Uh, Pretty exciting. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, we're very excited. We have a, a CubeSat, a 12U CubeSat, uh, about the size of a microwave oven is our approved uh, description, although I think it reminds me more of a case of beer. Sorry, that's not approved description, but, but basically you fit on this desk here, full size. Uh, we launched a couple weeks ago uh, with Rocket Lab. We're now two times further from the Earth than the Moon is, as of yesterday, so we're really excited. 22 times further than the Earth and Geo is, so we're really getting out there. We'll ultimately go about 1.5 million kilometers away on our way to the Moon, uh, where we'll be the first spacecraft to ever fly uh, near rectilinear halo orbit, uh, which is where NASA's gonna put their gateway for the Artemis program. So we're very much a Pathfinder mission. Uh, Capstone is an acronym. It's the Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment. 
So the Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System, or CAPS, uh, is, is basically a position navigation and timing technology. We'll demonstrate that uh, when we get to the moon. And then the Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment is really what we're doing right now, which is to say we're, we're improving how we operate in cislunar space beyond geo uh, into, in going into the moon. How can we do that first for our mission, but then in the future, how do we do that efficiently and effectively for follow-on missions, such as NASA's Artemis program and other commercial activities at the moon? So it's really, we're very proud of it. Thank you for, for asking and turning the tables on me a little bit here. Uh, but it is something that is happening right now, uh, very timely, uh, and has been a, a very exciting two weeks that, that we've been working on that since it, it launched. Well, congr congrats, Brad. I think it's going to be terrific. Look forward to seeing to do more. Hey, I, before I, I do get started, I, did, I, I felt I need to make one small correction or modification of some Eric said in the last panel. He said something about uh, at 24 years and up, you're a mentor. Is that what he said? Something like that? Okay, we could argue about that, but what I'd like to, a corollary I'd like to suggest is that there is no upper or lower limit to being a mentee. And in fact, uh, uh, I'm up here kind of as, I guess, the old guy, but uh, just, at, uh, at just in the last panel, I was texting one of my mentors, a guy named Pete Warden, that some of you may know in the audience, and I'm uh, going to get a chance to get together with him. He's got a long history in space, and you could look it up. But um, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted him to still be proud of me as being his mentee, and so I just wanted to get a uh, quick selfie with all of you. Okay. <laughs> there you go. All right, I'm going to send it to him, to him later. All right, okay, tell him you're helping up the next generation of folks. Um, hey, so, uh, the, so great question that Brad asked. And by the way, people still don't get this, even within the Department of Defense. What's the difference between U.S. Space Force and U.S. Space Command? And it really comes down to how we're organized as a Department of Defense. And it actually goes back... Um, uh, 30 uh, plus years to something called the Goldwater Nichols Act in the 1980s. And what that did is it said, uh, it basically said, hey, you know, this old practice that you have here, Department of Defense, where the people running the Army and the Navy and the Air Force also conducting operations in addition to doing their day jobs as sort of running the service doesn't work. Uh, we have to have uh, operational commanders that are not service uh, leaders. And so that's actually how we're organized, in case you didn't know that, Department of Defense. So if you've ever heard Central Command or European Command or Indo-Pacific Command, these are joint commands within our Department of Defense. And we call them joint because they're multi-service. The commander can be any service. And the people that work in those headquarters are of all services. And that's how we actually conduct warfighting operations. So if by chance there were to be a conflict in the Western Pacific in the future, the chief of naval operations, and it may be a greatly, mostly a maritime domain, the chief of naval operations, the person who runs the U.S. Navy, how much operational control will that person have in that fight? The answer is zero. Right? Admiral Gilday is the chief of naval operations. His office is in the Pentagon, just a few miles from here, and he would not have an operational role. The person who runs that, who would, want, who would be in charge of that conflict, is the Indo-Pacific Command commander, person named Admiral Aquilino today, happens to be an Admiral, could be an Air Force or, or a Army or maybe even Space Force General someday. Um, that's how we're organized. So when you come to space, we stood up a U.S. Space Force, a new service um, in, the, uh, in the United States military uh, coming up on three years ago now, a new branch, just like the Army or the Navy um, or, the, or the Air Force, the Marine Corps. And that chief of space operations, General Raymond, works in the Pentagon, just like the chief of naval operations. And his responsibilities day in and day out are to organize and train and equip the space force, to get the budget in place, to buy the right programs, to get the people recruited and trained. But if there were operations that needed to be conducted in the space domain, it isn't the space force leadership that's running that. It's going to be United States Space Command. And that's my boss today, Army General uh, Jim Dickinson. And our, uh, right now, our, our, our provisional headquarters is in Colorado Springs. That's where my office is, and that's where his office is. So we have two different organizations, and that's just how we do things across uh, the Department of Defense. Um, I do like to point out that both are new organizations, uh, both less than three years old. And... The, we're still learning about how both of these organizations should work within the broader Department of Defense and within the national security community and within the nation. 
One of the things that's interesting about being at U.S. Space Command that's kind of fun for me is um, we're still learning what it means to be a combatant command for space. We used to have a U.S. Space Command um, from 1985 to 2002. It was right after 9-11 and there was some realignment and the space activities in 2002 moved out. We stood down U.S. Space Command. But that old U.S. Space Command, its, its list of responsibilities was pretty short and it basically was what we would call a functional combatant command. Getting kind of technical here, but what that meant is it was just responsible for providing space capabilities to the other combatant commands around the globe. There was nothing in its mission set that said anything about space itself. The new U.S. Space Command that I'm working in today that stood up actually did have in its mission set, signed by the President, some new pieces to it including assigning U.S. Space Command an area of responsibility. Now, this is kind of important, right? Indo-PACOM, Indo-Pacific Command has an area of responsibility. It's defined by latitude and longitude and boundaries on the Earth's surface. So does U.S. European Command or U.S. Central Command or U.S. Southern Command. U.S. Space Command also has an area of responsibility, but it's not defined by latitude and longitude. It's defined simply as this, as that area extending, uh, starting at 100 kilometers above mean sea level and extending outward indefinitely. So we're fond of pointing out to Indo-Pacific Command that they have the second largest area of responsibility in the Department of Defense. We have the largest. But that actually drives a lot of interesting doctrinal, technical, and operational questions. What does it mean to be in charge of that area of responsibility? Right now, we are not focused on security challenges around Alpha Centauri. Okay, if, if Space News is here, Sandra, you can put that on the record. <laughs> um, but we are interested in the relevant strategic spaces um, within our AOR that are relevant for our department, for our nation, for our allies, and for the planet. And that's kind of an exciting place to be. So that's kind of a quick... Uh, quick rundown of the difference. I hope that made sense to folks, but it is different. I do need to reiterate that we have all services at U.S. Space Command today. Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, and of course, Space Force Guardians are part of our command. And that's exciting because that means we can use the capabilities that all services bring to U.S. Space Command. That's great. Thank, thank you for, for setting that context. Maybe as a, as a follow-up, um, would you share with, with the audience sort of the importance of space to the U.S. warfighter and then a little bit about what, what does that mean in terms of having a mission uh, from 100 kilometers to infinity? Obviously not including Alpha Centauri. We know that, know that but, but what other uh, you know, missions kind of follow within that as we set the, set the conversation here? Sure. You know, I, let me start broadly. And some of the I, some last panel was talking to this. I'm sorry I missed uh, Dr. Zerbuck. Maybe it's best that I wasn't here because I'd be pretty intimidated, I guess, from what I hear. But um, let me start with just our society, right? We are a space-enabled civilization. When did that start? Uh, I, 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 we, could, we, could start, we could have a discussion about when that started, but today uh, our civilization, civilization is enabled by space and it depends on space. And that translates directly to the joint warfighter. Our joint warfighting team today, and that includes all of the branches of services for our nation as well as those of our allies and potential competitors or adversaries, are enabled by space their warfighting capabilities. It's how power is projected across the planet. It's how uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, guardians, marines do their jobs. They rely on space. And by the way, that slope still has a positive value. Every day that passes, it seems space is more important, not less important to the warfighter and also to our society. And so that's a, now is actually so with, with great enabling power comes great responsibility. Now we have, a, we have a responsibility as a Department of Defense and as particular as a U.S. Space Command to protect and defend those capabilities in the time of combat so that our joint warfighters have what they need, to protect and defend those capabilities on behalf of society and civilization in the, in the, in the face of any potential threats. And so that's, how, that's our focus day in and day out and why we, why we exist. Um, the, the reality is that more than ever before also, these capabilities are under potential threat from potential adversaries. 
whether that's as, as uh, on one end of the spectrum, it's interference, electromagnetic interference, or dazzling from directed energy weapons or such, and at the other end of the spectrum, it's a uh, kinetic or even nuclear attack in space. All of those threats are real today, and we have to figure out how we address them so that the capabilities that our warfighters and our society depend on are there when they're needed. Thank you, and, and kind of given that importance, uh, certainly I couldn't have found the corner of the building today to get into without, without GPS and the other capabilities that are built on. I think all of you probably share the, the same feeling that with space, without space, I'm not sure how I could function. Um, and so obviously that extends into a, a national security perspective uh, as well. Another thing that, that occurs to me as we look at this event and other things going on is that there's a lot of dynamism right now in the space, uh, in the space industry, to use a, a sort of a pun, um, and that is between established systems, emerging systems, uh, operations in low Earth orbit and mid Earth orbit and geo and potentially beyond. Um, could you just speak a little bit to how you view, from a U.S. Space Command perspective, um, that new those new menu items maybe that you guys have to to, to choose from and how you would operate in, in today and going into the future in those different orbits and those different capabilities? Yeah. Well, so the first thing is that's pretty exciting, isn't it? We have all these uh, all these different ventures in space and and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, diverse activities and uh, more. Uh, elaborate or more extravagant uh, uh, business cases and markets and such. It's just, and it's not, I, I hope it doesn't slow down. I'm an optimist. I think it's going to keep on going. I think that's terrific. What it does do is it really, it actually adds complexity, though, to, to the domain, makes kind of our job harder. And it actually has been traditionally, and we sort of worked our way back into this kind of backwards. The Department of Defense has actually been responsible for uh, surveilling the space domain and looking for potential uh, hazards to include possible what we call conjunctions, right? When two objects come close to one another, if, if there's a piece of debris that's coming close to the International Space Station, who, who is, does any, I mean, did you know this? Do, who does NASA depend on to, to identify if that's, if that's happening? They're, they're not doing it them, themselves. They're actually relying on the Department of Defense. We actually have NASA folks out at Vandenberg Space Force Base today, which is our unit that does, does the kind of the big uh, computations to figure out where uh, uh, objects in space following their Keplerian trajectories are going to be, you know, a few days from now, a few weeks from now, and figure out if there's going to be a, a, um, a potential collision. We're doing that in the Department of Defense. It's getting more complicated. It's getting harder. And it's not just debris and national security payloads like it was in the Cold War. It's like actors of every conceivable kind. And some of them you heard about already here today. And so in that environment, we're probably at a point in a, in a governance uh, um, uh, situation where probably somebody else should be doing that rather than the Department of Defense. And so this is one of the discussions we're having at the national level right now about something called space traffic management. Who should really be in charge of that? Should be the Department of Defense. You know, it's roughly analogous to the Air Force AWACS early warning aircraft. You know, you know those the, pla the planes with the big radar dish on top, being doing air traffic control. I mean, they could, but they're really not best suited to do that. They're best suited to kind of look for threats, um, and uh, the FAA is best suited to kind of work out general traffic, which is the preponderance of what's out there. Because most of that, actually all that traffic wants to be tracked, right? They want, it, they want to know if, if they're going to, on a collision course, or they want to know if there's a safety issue, they want to. And most of those operating in space today want to be tracked and want to be part of a bigger picture and want to share information. And so that's probably best done by space, space traffic management, and that lets the Department of Defense focus on things that might involve actors that don't want to be tracked or are not up to a collective good. No, th thank you. And now, uh, as, as the person sitting here and as we just talked about, I have uh, a satellite that, that we own right now on its way to the moon. So the next topic is, is really I want to talk a little bit about what is going on above GEO, uh, in XGEO, as is sometimes referred to. Um, and so this, I think, fits into sort of what you had introduced at the beginning of your talks about your, your area of responsibility, how, how broad that is. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak uh, at all to the timelines with, with which you're thinking uh, above and, and beyond geo. Um, you know, I often hear these topics almost explained as, you know, 
in theory or someday or it's a, an issue. Um, and, and I feel like with my satellite now flying out there, that, that day is today. <laughs> I'd like to have a, a safe and transparent re region to operate in. Um, so just I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, that timeline. And then uh, also just to, to warn the team, this is maybe a, a spot where a couple astrodynamics just start to geek out after this. Huh. But, you know, just talking about orbits in space and how we, how we get around. All right. Um, well, OK, so uh, well, first, you know what's interesting about our area of responsibility? Like I said, it's not drawn on a map. So it's technically not a geographic area of responsibility. I like to call it an astrographic um, area of responsibility. It's not defined by lines. So geographic literally means drawn on the Earth, right? In the Greek, anyone who studied Greek here can confirm that for me. Um, and so with our with our AOR comes the question, right? I mean, you know, we try to do, we try to think about this, U.S. Space Command. You know, where are the threats today, and where could they be tomorrow? And um, we keep coming up with, as I said, Alpha Centauri, not anytime soon. But the cis lunar environment, yes, maybe. We need to be looking at that. And then, what do we think we need to get ourselves prepared for the possibility there could be a, there could be security challenges in the cis lunar environment? And the answer usually comes back pretty pretty clear to us, we need better awareness. We, we as a society actually don't have very, very good awareness of what's happening in the lunar environment. It's much different than the near Earth environment. The uh, gravi you know, orbits are not as stable. The gravity, uh, the three body problem is, is comes into effect. Uh, the coordinate system that we use here to track objects in low Earth orbit doesn't work in the lunar environment. It's a whole nother challenge. So we absolutely are thinking about that. And most of it is starting, most of what we focus on U.S. Space Command is advocating for some R&D capabilities to get a better understanding of what's happening in the lunar environment, what those, what those payloads or platforms or capabilities might look like. And then maybe the next questions we ask have to do with, you know, what are communications architectures that can reach out, out that far? And what are some other capabilities we might need? So I think it's just prudent strategic thinking. We need to be thinking about that. Hey, Brad, before I, I want to hit a point, there might be some in the audience that are saying, hey, um, you know, the Space Force and Space Command, and, and is there this, this, uh, this idea of, you know, militarizing space or, or, or even weaponizing space? Um, just a couple thoughts. Uh, first, um, our uh, potential adversaries are already doing some weaponization of space. And I would just ask you to, you could go ahead and Google what Russia was doing two years ago when they, were, when they put a, a, a clearly um, uh, obvious anti-satellite weapon in close proximity of one of our satellites in low Earth orbit. Or what the Russians did back in November when they did a, a debris-causing ASAT test and really caused a problem for a lot of people, including the ISS. I mean, that's happening. The second question we could ask philosophically is, should we be surprised? Maybe disappointed, maybe, but should we be surprised? And I think a starting point to that would be, where has human society ever gone where there hasn't been security issues? Didn't soon follow. And um, I don't know if there is an example of a place like that. And if that's true, and we kind of agree that that's a postulate to start with, how do you minimize the security challenges? Usually you do it by having means to secure that domain environment. Anyway. Yeah, no, and, and just to, to build on it too, as someone who's, our, my team is paying attention to CISLUNAR all the time, uh, it's not even just active satellites. I mean, we recently, it was widely reported, there was an upper stage from a launch a couple years ago um, that was detected by really an amateur astronomer mm -hmm. who saw it and, re and collectively the community realized it was going to impact the moon. But the interesting thing when it gets to the sort of safety and transparency of operating in cislunar space is that initially it was actually uh, attributed to one launch vehicle and it turned out after people studied it more, that was a misattribution of the stage. Fortunately, in this case, it impacted the moon, not, it did not cause any issues, but I mean, it's very important thing to know not only what's up there, where is it going, but also where'd it come from uh, so that people can, can attribute these things. And so I think yeah, that's certainly something that, that we're tracking and, and coordinating uh, as, as transparently as we can. What that, yeah, and what that example points out, Brad, just the, the ambiguousness of that example points out whether there are other things we have no idea are happening. Right, right. We just well, like, don't know. It, it, sort, of like, sort of careful what you wish for, right? If we, if we had total awareness, what else is there out there we might not be, uh, might not be tracking? 
Um, and so, so as promised, I did want to give you an opportunity, sir. I know you've, you've created some new vocabulary in the, in the course of conversations and, and publications. You, had, you, you alluded to astrographic uh, in, a moment ago. I just wanted to give you the chance there to, to maybe set up your, some other terms that, that you've uh, pioneered. Just, I mean, this is the future of the industry. Sure. So I think if we plant the <laughs> seed here, uh, you know, perhaps we'll get some momentum behind it. Um, okay. Well, since you asked, yeah. um, uh, <laughs> hey, so one one word I've been um, been using a little bit more, and I, I have this discussion when I talk with other folks at the Pentagon. So there's a lot of talk in defense circles about global operations and looking at things globally, right? Can't can't look at things regional anymore. We got to look at things globally. I usually like to point out that's not enough, because we have this large area of responsibility, which is exactly not the globe. It's everything but, and so I've thrown out the word uh, supra-global. So you know we have our Semper Supra is our uh, Space Force motto, supra-global. Um, it's a new word, supranational is not though. We use the word supranational. A lot of, we, I saw on the last panel, there's a lot of political scientists expertise here in the room, right? We talk about organizations, whether they're terrorist or business or whatever that are greater than national. So we really need to think about our security problems from a supra-global perspective, so I throw that out. And then, um, and I know Brad wanted me to talk about these because you brought it up earlier. I, I was also uh, pointed out in that latest article that I'd written that, um, you know, we don't, the space domain is not intuitive from a physics perspective. Um, and the dynamics and, the, and the, the physics and therefore the tactics and techniques, procedures and, and the ways that we'll think about um, maneuver in that domain are necessarily going to be different than they are in the terrestrial domain. And so we... I suggested that really the way to think about at least the, uh, the Earth-Moon environment is in terms of this gravity well. And you could really think of all of space as just a series of gravity wells that are all driven by, or how we, how we maneuver within those is really driven, not really so much speed and distance, but by energy and angular momentum if you're inside a gravity well. So I introduced, I suggested the words up well and down well. If you're going up a gravity well, then you're going up well. Not going uphill, because coming downhill takes energy too. You're going up well, and if you're coming down a gravity well, you're going down well. And then, you know, Brad got kind of uh, intellectually annoying uh, earlier, and then said, uh, "Well, what about uh, capstone? Right? You may be going between gravity wells. So what's that? Is that interwell or yeah. transwell? Crosswell. We have to Cross get well. some, some okay. folks on that. Yeah. Xwell, inwell. Anyway." Why, do, why, why think about that? It's just a way to realize that the domain's different. We need to think about it just a little bit differently, make sure we aren't bringing too much um, uh, parad paradigm, uh, the baggage of a paradigm of what we know into that, dom into that domain. Well, well, perfect. And uh, I think we have time for maybe just one more uh, uh, kind of back and forth, and then we'll uh, wrap up for our next panel, which is really, I think, going to be an engaging conversation on innovation uh, in, in the DOD. And so I, I think we'll leave that panel to answer the innovation question. Um, but I thought, as we have you here, a real privilege, and we have this great audience here, is there anything you would want to leave our audience with uh, if, if you could rewind just a few years, maybe when you would be in a seat like this, and, and what would you have hoped someone had, had given you advice or guidance or had you think about? Well, the first thing, I mean, the first thing kind of transcends just the space topic, right? So whatever you're really excited about is what you should be travel, uh, uh, following and trying to do in life, right? Don't do what someone else tells you, tells you to do. Do what you're excited about. I did the math. Life is pretty short. It kind of goes by pretty quick. So you shouldn't be doing it. You shouldn't be spending the only commodity you really have, which is time doing something you're not interested in. So do something you're interested in. I'm looking forward to the innovation panel. I, I would say that... Um, What's interesting about space uh, today, whether it's the uh, commercial sector or the civilian sector or the security sector, is there isn't a single space technology that exists that doesn't have some sort of national security application. Haven't found one yet, anyway. If you find one, let me know. So that's interesting, right? And that isn't necessarily true in the other domains, but anything that we're doing in space, any, any effort, has some sort of national security uh, um, benefit or application. So that means there's a lot of teaming that should be going on, probably more than that is, um, to make us really kind of advance, go advance forward in space. I would particularly point out, I'm, I'm fond of saying that space and cyber, because I know a lot of you, how many hands here are kind of more cyber background or information systems? I know there's a lot of you, I think, okay. Um, space and cyber are BFFs, right? There's nothing 
uh, that happens in space that doesn't rely on cyber, and many things that cyber does today go through space. And so those technologies are really closely interwoven, and we'll be using those um, quite a bit moving forward. All right, well, I enjoyed the chance to talk with you today. Thanks, Brad. Again, best of luck with Capstone. I think it's terrific, and um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to hang out here, I think, for the rest of the afternoon. Look forward to hearing the next panel and to, and to my friend Chirag Parikh when he comes to talk to us late, later on. Wonderful. Well, thank you, sir, very much. So I'll take my fireside hat off and I'll put my moderator hat on. Uh, I'd like to now introduce one of another great and active board members who's uh, been instrumental in the programming and the, uh, the, the function of the Future Space Leaders Foundation. Uh, if we could have Deborah Factor, please uh, come up here to introduce the panel. Uh, Deborah's the head of U.S. Space Systems at Airbus U.S. Space and Defense. I'm going to be moderating our next panel. <laughs> 